Welcome to Wiggies. It is Friday morning, the 2nd of January, and when I drove up it was 14 degrees. So I thought that was a good reason to talk about insulation. And today I'm going to give you the history of insulation verbally. I've written about it over the years. But we're going to start in 1960 when DuPont came out with a fiberfill product for batting purposes called Dacron 88. And Dacron 88 was basically chopped staple fiber, just like I'm showing you here. And it was bonded. They would put the fiber through guard editing machines and they had spray bonders that would spray the fiber and it would hold it together. And that was sold to quilters who would quilt it up and put it into jackets. Up until that time, people using floor sweepings at textile factories and chopping up the cotton or the wool fabric into fiber and make batting out of it. This was much lighter in weight, it's nice and clean, and it did a far, far better job. It was the original alternative to down. At that time, if you wanted a really warm garment, you bought a down coat. DuPont never called it an alternative to down, but that's exactly what it was. And this was used, and is still used today. The difference is that back then DuPont had a lot of controls over the fiber and they made a quality product. And then as time went by, in the 60s, Eastman Chemical Company came out with their polyester fiber product called Codel. And it was a little different in terms of the crimp, the crimp being the uh, what they put into the fiber to make it stay away from and loft up. And then a company called Selenese came out with their product called Fortrell. And they were the three kingpins of the outdoor industry. Whether it was snow suits for kids, ski wear, snowmobile suits, uh, Carhartt type merchandise for workers, those were the three companies. And in the mid-60s, the ski wear industry was told that their garments were too fluffy and the girls didn't like looking like the Michelin Man. So the industry came up with what is known as needle punched polyester batting. Now what they would do is take this much fiber and they would put it on a scrim. It's a non-woven material, looks like paper, but it's much, much stronger obviously. And they had a board with needles every quarter of an inch that had barbs that went down and came up. And they took all this fiber and they reduced it to this much thickness. And now the ski wear companies were able to make very fashionable garments. And they sold like crazy. Winter time came, men and women would go skiing, and lo and behold, they were freezing their butts off. Why? Because that much thickness, even though it's the same weight as this, doesn't have near as much insulation capability. So the bottom line is that the down jacket companies suddenly had a boom because down jackets made you look like a Michelin man but you stayed warm. And so they started selling a lot of down jackets. And then in 1968 a company called Selenese came out with a continuous filament product which was called Polaguard. And this is what it looks like. You've got all these fibers, they're continuous. They go from side to side. And now you had something that was as soft as down, 
as lofty as down. And I did not know it at the time, because I was selling it, that it was actually more efficient than down at keeping people warm. I just figured it was doing the same thing, thickness for thickness. But ultimately over the years I've learned that down absorbs moisture. When it absorbs the moisture, it starts losing its loft. As it loses its loft, it loses its insulating capabilities. And that never happens to this product. But this was a single product being made by one company. And there were other companies out there that wanted to be in the insulation business for the, for the outerwear marketplace, regardless of the end use, mountain climbing, skiing, snowmobiling. So they went ahead and started making chop staple fiber fill products. And they put a lot of money into the advertising. And then 3M came out with their Thinsulate. Thinsulate is what is in this boot that I talked about in the last video. I'm going to pull it out. Now this is 1,000 gram Thinsulate per square yard. If you look at this product, this is actually uh, 10 ounces per square yard. Do you think that you've got the same insulation in this that you have in this? The answer is no. What I also did not know, but 3M provides this to the shoemakers with quilting. It's, a, it's called a two inch diamond. And what we do know about quilting is that every single stitch line, every single stitch in the line, is a cold spot. So this tells me another reason why those boots won't work below about 25, 30 degrees. But anyway, this is made from polypropylene, and the polypropylene is what they use to make their surgical masks and it's what's known as a microfiber and it compacts down very very easily and it has no resilience whatsoever. So they put this on the market and it didn't work very well so they decided to blend 35 percent of the polyester fiber the 65% of the polypropylene and that became the Thinsulate that was used in jackets for a few years. I don't know anybody that uses it today in this country but it never worked particularly well. But they had a lot of money so they sold it. Advertising dollars. Now you go into the 1980s and a company in Albany, New York called Albany International, they had fiber fill processing equipment. And so they got a contract from Natick Laboratories to produce a synthetic alternative to down. And I said to them, DuPont created the synthetic alternative in 1960. What's different about your stuff? And the reality is that they're using a finer denia fiber. Well, the finer the denia, the less resilience, the less insulating capability. But they had this $700,000 contract, actually there's two of them, from Natick Labs to produce this synthetic alternative to down. And they got a patent on it that gives you an idea of how efficient the patent office is because there had already been patents on fiber fill products for years. This was not new. This was essentially a duplication with the exception of going from a six denia fiber to a three denia fiber or whatever. And they put it onto the marketplace 
with very limited success until the military adopted it and it went into a lot of military garments. Now that's all come to an end as far as I know and now all the military uses in those same garments is continuous filament fiber which is a step in the right direction for the military. <clears throat> anyway, they and now they've come out with their own continuous filament product which is a different construction than this one. Uh, instead of the fibers going from side to side the way they are in what I use, they have the fibers running straight out and believe it or not, back in the late 60s, early 70s, I think it was the late 60s, we made a product doing the exact same thing. And what we discovered was that we didn't have a product that had any value. So it was expensive, it was thin, so we just shelved it. All these years later, these guys from Primaloft, Primaloft became a company unto itself, uh, and they've come out with this Asian-produced, straight-out, continuous filament product, which doesn't have any particular function, but they promote it. And maybe they have a customer too that's buying it, I don't know. Reality is it's expensive and doesn't work. Then in recent times, in the past year or two, the cost of down has increased to the point that about uh, what they claim is 600 fill down is about $100 a pound. Well, that's a lot of money to put into a jacket. And so, the Primaloft people have come out with some sort of a synthetic down and I think they sold it to the North Face as fiber balls or something like that and it also has a history going back into the 60s or 70s where DuPont made this stuff and they walked away from it and if DuPont walks away from something you can't expect it to be any good because DuPont is a really fine company. They didn't get to be doing billions and billions of dollars over a two or three hundred year lifespan being dumb. So they walked away from it. Then recently I read that 3M has come out with featherless down fiber fill product. Everything that you're looking at here is featherless down. There is no feathers, there's no down clusters, it's all polyester fiber. So they're going to try and sell this to the marketplace. And in order to do that, they probably will have to give incentives and advertising allowances and stuff of that nature. So when, when I look at this product, which I grew up with, the only way you can use this product and keep it structurally sound is if you quilt it. Of course, once you quilt it, you've got all those stitch lines, you've got all those cold spots. And it loses its resilience pretty quickly. I won't even talk about Thinsulate any longer. The needle punch, uh, this is a good material to use if you want to beef up the front of a garment that has a flap that goes over a zipper in the collars. Um, if you want to make a springtime jacket, I suppose you could put this in there. But for all intents and purposes, it is not an acceptable form of insulation. Uh, period. This, you know, if you used it that way, you wouldn't have to quilt it because it's structurally very strong. But, but it's not going to keep you warm. Now you come to the continuous filament. There's a lot of things that I did not know about continuous filament when the mill I was with started producing it. But I did know one thing about it. Having been in the fiber fill business from 1961, having learned everything there was about all the other products, 
when I looked at this product, I saw what I believed then, and certainly believe now, is the finest insulating material ever produced by a man. It will outperform everything that is grown by a bird. Um, it does not retain water. If you look at the first video that I did, I put it into a bucket of water and you see that when you pull it out of the water, all the water drains out of it and the loft comes back. Um, <clears throat> when I vacuum pack it for the Air Force, uh, those sleeping bags and outfits that I do can stay in those vacuum pack packages under 20 tons of pressure for 10, 15, 20 years. And when you break it out, it all comes back. It does not deteriorate. Now, like I said, we, we have these vacuum packed survival kits that we make for the Air Force. Here is one of the sleeping bags that we've had on display for, I don't know, eight or nine years. And this is the Antarctic bag for 60 below zero. And it's in a space that's four inches thick by 12 inches square. And if you had to take it out of this package and use it, um, within an hour, it'll be back almost to its normal thickness even though it's been in here for all these years. Um, now one of the things that I've noticed in the industry is companies that have been trying to improve the, the performance of their sleeping bags. And the reality is that it's very, very difficult to improve the performance of your sleeping bags if the people who are charged with that job have no background <clears throat> in the insulation that goes into the bags. So they wind up doing the status quo. I offered the information that I'm presenting here many years ago to all the different manufacturers. I've even talked with some of them about private labeling their bags using Lamolite so they'd be made in America and they all turned me down. One company I said, I'll make your stuff here in the United States under private label and I'll sell you the insulation and let you come into my factory to learn how to use it properly. And you can make these bags any place in the world that you have a factory. And they turned me down. So the reality is that the ultimate consumer is getting a raw deal when they see a brand name that's been around for a lot of years and they think that the sleeping bags that they sell actually work at the temperatures they assign to them. A lot of these manufacturers, well I don't think they're manufacturers, they're marketing companies today, are showing jackets that have diamond quilts and little squares and you know they're like a one by two inch square and how much insulation can you put in there and then you have them all over the garment so you got all these stitch lines and all these stitch lines are cold spots but they're telling you that this stuff is going to keep you warm and I'm telling you it will keep you warm so long as you're in your house and you've got a heater on. It's not going to keep you warm out in the street when it's 14 degrees the way it is here in Grand Junction. Um, so if you want to stay warm in your sleeping bag, the Fiberfill product you should look for is Lamolite. If you want to stay warm in cold weather clothing, Fiberfill product you should look for in the clothing is Lamolite. If you want your feet to be warm, Lamolite socks. It really doesn't make any difference what you use the Lamolite for. It just works better 
than any other product on the market. Thanks for your time and have a good year.